Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Brendan Emser, and I'm a senior editor here at Aperture in New York. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a conversation with three incredibly talented photographers, each of whom are featured in the most recent issue of Aperture magazine called Counter Histories, which is produced in collaboration with Magnum Foundation and is informed by Magnum Foundation's ongoing Counter Histories grant initiative. This issue considers how photographers, through an engagement with archives or through their own observational work, can present and examine contested histories in a fresh, imaginative way. Today, we are joined by Sidreen Shedig, Abdo Shanan, and Linda Kushle Sobekwa, artists who each question dominant historical narratives to create layered portrayals of place, culture, and community. Sedrin engages with legacies of the Black diaspora, tracing her relationship to Afro-Caribbean history and community in French Guiana. In the Eastern Cape of South Africa, Linda Kushle Sobekwa reflects on the movement of Black migrant labor and envisions what he calls a family tree of the country. And Abdo Shanan, working in Algeria, builds a speculative archive for his own generation. It's been a pleasure working with three of you on this issue of the magazine, and uh, also to have seen some of you recently in New York or in Paris. And I just have to add, especially for Lindo and Abdo, the ongoing creative relationships that we've had together at Aperture over the years have been truly inspiring. For those of you who might not be familiar with Aperture, we are a nonprofit publisher that leads conversations around photography around the world. From our base in New York, Aperture connects global audiences and supports artists through our acclaimed quarterly magazine, books, exhibitions, digital platforms, public programs, limited edition prints, and awards. Aperture's programs are made possible by the generosity of our board of trustees, our members, and other individuals, and in part by the New York State Legislature. I'd like to thank our subscribers to Aperture Magazine, all of whom support Aperture and our programs and keep us going. Magnum Foundation expands creativity and diversity in visual storytelling, activating new audiences and ideas through the innovative uses of images. Through grant making, mentorship, and creative collaborations, they partner with socially engaged image makers, exploring new modes of storytelling. Since their founding in 2007 by members of the Magnum Photos Cooperative, they have made more than 600 direct grants to visual storytellers from over 80 countries. I would like to thank the entire Magnum Foundation team who have been amazingly collaborative partners on this very special project and who have also helped support a series of short video documentaries about some of the artists featured in this issue, uh, which are currently rolling out on Aperture's website, aperture.org. I also want to acknowledge the brilliance of Magnum Foundation's executive director, Kristen Lovin, and board president, Susan Mizellis, whose generosity and expansive vision have made a formidable impact on photographers and artists around the world. We will be taking audience questions today at the end of the program. So uh, I hope you will contribute. We have a fantastic group of people on this call today. It's so exciting to see how many uh, folks have turned tuned in. Uh, so please feel free to quote to post your questions in the Q&A box and uh, we'll get to some of them toward the end of the program. I'm just going to turn it over to my colleague for a little preview of the issue, uh, Counter Histories, and then we'll invite our speakers to join.
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Abdo, you are the first one <laughs> to join us. One second. Um, are you there? Hi, Abdo. Hi. Tell us uh, where you're zooming in from today. I'm um, zooming in from Oran, Algeria, from my family's house. Wonderful. I'm so happy to see you. I'm just going to share uh, some slides of your work now. Um, for every, everyone to uh, know, Abdo Shanan was born in Oran, Algeria, to a Sudanese father and an Algerian mother. In 2015, Abdo received a nomination for Magnum Foundation, um, the Magnum Foundation Emergency Fund. And in the same year, he founded uh, Collective 2020, uh, which is a platform for Algerian photographers. In 2016, his series Diary Exile was selected for the Addis Photo Fest in Ethiopia. And we actually published um, a selection of that work called Diary Exile um, in the Platform Africa issue of Aperture Magazine in 2017. In 2018, Abdo was one of 10 photographers selected for the Arab Documentary Photography Program. He won the Contemporary African Photography Prize for his project, Dry, selections of which were featured in the 2018 Aperture Summer Open here in New York City. And in 2020, he was the winner of the Premi Mediterranean Albert Camus Incipien Award. In the same year, he uh, co-curated narratives from Algeria at the Pasquar Photo Forum in Switzerland. And in 2022, he was one of uh, Sheikh Saoud Altani Awards for his project, A Little Louder. And he had his first solo show at the Photography Center in Geneva. Abdo, I'm really happy to welcome you here and also to have had the privilege of working with you on multiple different projects at Aperture over the last, uh, I think, six years. In mm -hmm. Your work is uh, featured in Counter Histories, the current issue of Aperture. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it, the archival images that, that you brought together, how you found them, and also the new photographs that you made specifically uh, for the magazine? Uh, thanks, Brendan. Uh, thanks, Aperture, for the invitation. Uh, but also, I have to thank Magna Foundation and AFA for their support. Uh, I think our journeys would be extremely difficult without their support. Um, well, the right to our memory uh, started from a simple question. Usually, my projects start with questions, but my own questions. But this particular project started with uh, a question uh, asked by a friend of mine. Uh, we were in a cafe, and he asked me to look around uh, at the pictures hanged uh, on that cafe. Um, most of the pictures were from the colonial era. Uh, then I started to think that it is actually the case for many cafes and restaurants in, in Algeria. That led me to ask myself another question, why? Uh, why uh, after a bloody um, independence war uh, and after um, over 60 years of independence, we still using these pictures uh, with their own, uh, um, they come with their own narrative. Um, but that question, I think, I uh, it was just the beginning and the opening for a wider option uh, a question: Where are we as Algerian people uh, in that frame, in that picture? Um, after more than sixty years, um, when I look back, I feel like we are the big absent from that image. Uh, the Algerian image. Uh, we are the big absent from uh, the national narrative, from um, how Algeria would look like. Uh, if you Google Algeria, most of the pictures you will have, probably they are from um, uh, a new newspapers or magazines. Uh, they, they gives you the feeling that we are in a constant breaking news. Um, it's not the Algeria I know. It's not the people I know. It's not the, the people I care about. Um, I feel like we have our, our own memory were hijacked by uh, an elite um, through their control of media, newspaper. Um, they control who we see uh, and how they look. Um, for instance, most of the most of the newspapers we see only the elite from the Algerian government um, or the sportsmen, sportswomen, uh, and when we see people are just maybe doctors or farmers. Are they are there because they want, they need them to illustrate an opinion. Um, so uh, basically, I just asked people around me if they can give me access to the family albums because I think that there is a through image of this country, and I think this uh, country is uh, 
suffered from many forgotten stories uh, over the past years, over the past decades, not even years, uh, that need to be seen, that need to be told. And, uh, and I, I, I believe in the power of um, um, the, the, the simple, the power of the normal. You don't have to be a hero uh, to be shown or to be in a, in a frame. You can be just an ordinary person and you contribute to the narrative or the history of this country. Um, um, of course, uh, th these archives are just family archives are just part of the, of the project. There's another part where I imagine um, a future uh, archive uh, of this country, the present, how the present will look like for the future. Uh, this is why I'm, this is my own contribution, like trying to photograph those people who live in my time uh, to keep that trace for the future. Um, imagining that there's a future where maybe social media will, not, will, will never be there. What can we leave as a trace uh, from now? Um, and also that comes from uh, um, a, a belief I have is that we cannot move to the future without passing by the present. Unfortunately, in my country, I feel like we're stuck in the past. Like the past is brought up all the time and we forgot about the present. And it's like, that's all that matters. There's a future waiting for us, but we cannot go to the future if we're gonna, if we are not uh, living the past, if we are not recording the past, if we, if not, if we are not telling their present, if we are not recording the present. This is my attempt to contribute, but also, uh, I don't think it's my own, my own, it's my duty, me alone. I think other people will contribute and will have to contribute for the sake of the um, the history of this country. Um, uh, it's an ongoing project with a lot of questions, with a lot of directions that I need to take. Um, uh, nothing is uh, definite, nothing is uh, sure, but this is what I love about um, at this moment that I love about creating a project is the certainty of certainty and certainty of creating uh, those many directions uh, I have to take. I can share a story for just to give an example about the context I live in. This is a picture of the Museum of uh, National Museum for Martyrs for, uh, for Independence War Martyrs uh, or Heroes. Uh, I went there and attempt to take pictures for my project and for uh, the commission work by Aperture uh, because there are many artifacts, many pictures. I can just, you know, take pictures to show a point. I got there and uh, the security uh, guy, he told me, he didn't even look at me. He told me he should get a ticket. I got a ticket. I got my camera, but he didn't see my camera. I show him a ticket and the next, the next thing he said, it's not allowed to take pictures. And I was like, this is my, our own museum for our own history and we are not allowed to take pictures. It's like, it's a private uh, collection of our own history that we are not allowed to do whatever we want to do uh, with. And that's, and also I can share another, another story uh, just to show how important the image uh, in, our, in my country, but also how crazy it is. We've been ruled by a sick president for seven years, the former president. Uh, he ruled with his own picture. He disappeared. Uh, the only thing that lasts, uh, that kept him in power is his own picture as a president. Um, that's, to me, it's one of uh, the crazy points about how important is photography and how is used, how photography is used in my country and how also contributed that, um, um, that we became uh, the, um, the, the big absent from this, this image. Somebody pushed it out, pushed us out. And I think it's time for us to be, to be back in there. Thank you for that. The image on the screen currently is an installation view of an exhibition, um, part of the Counter Histories project here at the Magnum Foundation um, office and gallery in New York City. And Abdo made a special installation for this exhibition. Abdo, can you just talk a little bit about um, the images that we just saw, color images, uh, family pictures, vernacular images, and the black and white images so people on this call can understand the different types of image regimes you're working with and which ones you made yourself and which ones you collected? I can go back. Um, yeah. uh, some of the black and white, like uh, the, 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 these ones are scanned from the, 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 the school picture is uh, um, uh, from a family album, mm -hmm. uh, a, a friend of mine. 
Uh, the one on the left is a picture of uh, a painting of uh, Blues that was, was um, um, a hero in, in, in my country. Uh, also, these kind of images, they serve a, per a specific purpose to show how images are used in the public sphere, you know, which images are shown and which images are not shown and how they are shown. Uh, there is also, if you can go back to the cover, uh, the cover of the story. Yes, please. All right, this one. Yeah. yeah. Um, this one. This is a, a picture I take of my of uh, two of my of my my friend Sarah and her sister. Um, uh, this is my attempt to contribute to that to to the to the future. You know, to the future archive to leave a trace of the present. You know, as an attempt to maybe we can move to the future to really move to the future. Uh, photographically speaking, of course, I'm not talking about all aspects of future. Um, and also, if if you can go back to the uh, to uh, to the installation, please. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the 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 the, uh, the black and white grainy picture in the middle, where you, you can see the, the photos, you know, just laid out over it, is a scan from a picture from a newspaper. Because uh, I'm I'm scanning these as well. I'm using them as a, a comparison point between. What is kept as a private in our, our family albums and what is shown in the newspaper and this is like this is a picture of the former Algeria president uh, Hawaii Bumidian um, saluting some citizens and the captions is said like the citizens of that city came in out to salute the president we all know it's not the reality of things but it's just uh, a way to um, uh, reclaim uh, our own uh, uh, our, our own presence, you know, we are not here just to salute a president. We are here to exist. We are here uh, because this is our own space. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if we are talking about uh, uh, a frame of uh, or, or uh, a picture. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you for that um, yeah. um, introduction to this work, which is so multi-layered personal photographs, news images, images of martyrs that you found on the in, in postcards, and also your own quite beautiful um, black and white work. And you've blended it together um, in such a fascinating way that does what you say about interrogating history, but also holding space for creating a narrative um, that you feel is more truthful and um, more representative of, of the present, you said, passing by the present to understand the future. It's beautifully put. Um, Abdo, thank you so much. We will hear thank more you. from you later in the conversation. And yeah. um, Sidrine, I will invite you next um, to join us. Hi, Sidrine. And can you tell us uh, where you're Zooming in from today? I'm currently in a residence in the Swiss mountains, but I usually live and work in Paris. Right, amazing. Um, Sidrine uh, Shedig is a French Caribbean photographer who graduated from the Ecole Nationale Supérieure um, in Arles, one of the great uh, photography schools in France. Her work is anchored between Europe and the Americas and explores Blackness and the spaces where it's inhabited, redefined, and transformed on a daily basis. In 2021, uh, Cedrine's work was exhibited in Arles at the festival there and won the Prix Dior de la Photographie for Young Talent. Congratulations on that. And actually, I learned about your work, Cedrine, from the writer Kaylin Wilson-Goldie, who is a regular contributor to Aperture Magazine. She happened to see your exhibition at the MEP studio in Paris last year and immediately wrote me and said, this is one to watch. And uh, indeed, uh, I'm really have been so excited to learn about your work, to meet you personally, and to um, publish a new body of work, um, not the work that was shown in Paris, but a brand new body of work in this issue of um, Aperture. So um, why don't we start a, a little bit with um, just some context. This is an installation view from your show in Paris last year at MEP. Could you just tell us the title of the show, Citrine, and a little bit about the themes you were working with for this particular project before we get into your portfolio? Yes, so this exhibition at MEP was called De la Mer à la Terre, 
And the idea was to um, explore in the same space two different uh, sides of the ocean. So one part of the exhibition was dealing with uh, the Caribbean diaspora in uh, the suburbs of Paris, and the other side of the show was dealing with um, uh, the island of Mar, the youth in, on the island of Martinique. So there was a little bit like this uh, cross, um, like view or look uh, on both sides of the ocean, mm -hmm. which somehow, like is um, also speaking about like my double um like my, my background or my dual identity and uh, a will to explore a little bit like what it means to be a caribbean today mm -hmm. and yes. then there's a, a view of an exhibition in porto in, in portugal yeah is so the same it was the same work shown then um at saluto mon which is a gallery uh in porto last september so this work has been turning a little bit um, over like different photo festivals over the last year after the exhibition at MEP. There was also like a small publication that's been made by, uh, with Morel Books um, at the same time as the exhibition. And while the exhibition was opening in Paris, I was actually going to Guyane for um, a residency there. And this is where I made the work that's been now um, published in the portfolio and aperture. Fantastic. Well, let's, let's get right into that. So um, yes, tell us a little bit about how this work was made. I know you were on a residency and some of the themes that you were working with and maybe how it complemented um, your previous body of work that we just had a brief introduction to. Yeah, I think it's important maybe to give a little bit like more context about the way I work in general and where like I've been coming from in order to do this project. So like over the last five years, well, I've been in Arles and after I've been developing like a photographic practice that... Um, is in short between Europe and the Americas. So first looking at uh, the French Caribbean oversea islands, uh, Guadeloupe, where my dad is from, and the neighbor island Martinique, where I've produced like works over almost a period of three years. And I've been then expanding to French Guiana uh, with this residency, which was the object of the publication in Aperture. And my vision somehow is to keep on expanding geographically across the region with an idea of like having a work spanning over time and over space or different spaces to draft somehow like a sensitive understanding of the region and to build like a dialogue between spaces um, that are most often thought of and, and looked at through their relationship with the former colonial mother countries, rather than in relation to each other. So for me, it's this approach of like kind of putting into dialogue, like Martinique and Guadeloupe and Guyane that are like this French overseas, but always looked at through the prism of France is quite interesting. Like I want these this spaces to have dialogue in between each other and not only through France. So I think this is like one of the main end devour behind my practice. So I've been working in French Guiana thanks to um, an invitation from the very great uh, photographic festival. It's called Photographic Encounters of Guyane. And it's like very important, very unique um, structure for our, for the artistic, um, like in the artistic and geographical context of the Caribbean, which is marked by like the absence of galleries, not, not really like art schools or art institutions so somehow they are a bit like the only structure that is supporting photography um on those territories and they do like an amazing job and uh, can we just pause on this image here which is um a behind the scenes look of you making the portrait that uh, making this portrait yes. and yeah can you just tell us a little bit about how you found your subjects and how it was to be working there and i will just note that in her article kaylin Wilson Goldie mentions that you have a very labor intensive practice. You use big cameras and film and you want to slow down a little bit as a way of pushing against how cameras are often used in a ethnographic manner in um, places such as the Caribbean or Latin America or elsewhere. Um, but yeah, just tell us a little bit about this image that we're looking at because it's, it's quite fascinating. Yeah, so I've been working there over the course of five weeks, which is like was a very short time frame for me. So I had to think also a lot um, about like, what do I actually want or have to say about Guyan and like in a, such a short time frame and without like having such a deep understanding of the place because I know the islands, for example, much better. 
So the idea was simply to work in the continuation of what I've been doing in like in Martinique, which is to look for connections across like people and territories from the point of view of urban culture and vernacular practices. And like portraiture is quite a central uh, to my practice as well as the idea of the vernacular, like the objects, clothes, ornaments, or ritual gestures found in the landscape or in architecture. Like there is an overall fascination in my work for the vernacular of the post-colonial city in the Caribbean um, and its urban culture. And this I think go like show through the people I choose to photograph and all the details I try to put in the pictures. Um, I photograph mostly young people. I'm very much interested in youth. Uh, I think because somehow the, the relationship I have to the Caribbean was very much with my father and the generation of my father at this like very, the, the image of the Caribbean person that's been constructed for his generation is very different to what you can experience as a young person there today. So I work also a lot with the idea of challenging somehow stereotypes of what the Caribbean is or what we imagine Caribbean people are or that this space also is. I would say, um, wait, I often state that the, Car the Caribbean have been heavily represented through uh, the tourism industry, but also like the European colonial imagination. So like with massive representations of like deserted beaches or like over green exotic nature. So I love the idea to work a little bit with like, like mostly uh, with a little bit, but also mostly against representations, but actually focusing on the city and the urban practices mm -hmm. and the um, like the forms of living that are being produced there, especially among young people. So I don't work in the form of narrative stories. I think this I have to say because people often in photography expect like series and stories. So I don't work in the form of like narrative stories. And I think this is what made this work easy, even though I was there for a short period of time, what I look for. I work a little bit like with an associative language or what I like to call like an associative language, which I think is quite interesting with the medium of photography because it's like it, this cat that then when it's juxtaposed to next to something else can create like new meanings and new associations and new collision and new like encounters so I work a lot with this idea of like associating um, images and uh, and landscapes as well I mean they're images without figures yes, 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 very and, very much yeah can you talk a little bit about yeah your your look uh, the non-figurative work, the landscapes and details such as the one that we're in now, like what, how were these figuring into the project as well? What I find interesting with the, um, the idea of the landscape in the Caribbean, this this was also an idea that was quite present in the writing of Edouard Glisson, which is like this French Caribbean like author I love. Mm -hmm. He thinks about the landscape in the Caribbean as some type of a witness of history of like monuments. So it's not at all this kind of like depoliticized nature. It's really like a historic historic thing. Like it's a witness of history, and it's also like the way people engage with landscape in the Caribbean, I feel it is quite specific because it's, there's been a whole history of not really owning the land. Mm -hmm. And like, like the, I would say most of the societies were built through plantations, but were actually like nature that is tamed and that where you have to work. And after like the, the, after the end of slavery, people have been massively like leaving the countryside to go to the cities because somehow these were places associated more with agency than the land was. So I think there is like this very interesting um, relationship to like nature is at the same time very present in the everyday life, but there is like, I think a different relationship to it. We have a very contemplative and like, depoliticized relationship to nature in Europe, for example, mm. where it's quite different. And this is why I like to introduce it. I have to I like to have it in the pictures quite a bit because I find it's somehow a little bit historical. Absolutely. Well, I am very intrigued by the connections between your work and Abdo's that we just looked at, in particular, the idea of photographing young people to tell stories about the past and history and this idea of how um how history is reframed you know through pictures of 
youth, the landscape, um, and especially details in urban places or um, elsewhere. Thank you so much, Cedrine. We'll hear more from you um, shortly. And I would like now to invite Linda Kushley to join us on camera. Linda, Linda Kushway Sobekwa is a South African photographer born in Katalhong, Johannesburg. Sobekwa came to photography in 2012 through his participation in Of Soul and Joy, an educational program uh, run in a township southeast of Johannesburg. In 2017, Sobekwa was selected by Magnum Foundation for um, a photography and social justice initiative to develop the project, I Carry Her Photo With Me, which will soon be published as a book, uh, which we'll hear a bit about shortly. In 2018, he received um, the Magnum Foundation Fund to continue his long-term project, Neope, and he has been selected for the residency Cité des Arts Réunion. So Bechua became a Magnum nominee in 2018 and a member, a full member in 2022. And I should just add that I had the pleasure of meeting um, Linda Kushley, um when you were only 22 years old um, at the studio of Mikhail Subatsky um, in 2016 when we were researching uh, the Platform Africa issue of Aperture. And I'm really grateful for a, the longstanding creative relationship and our your continued engagement with Aperture on multiple platforms. <laughs> um, the slide that we're looking at now is an online story that we produced um, with, with Linda and the writer Nicole Achampong. Um, about the project that Lindo made with his about his sister, and maybe we'll start there since that was our our kind of um, first time we published your your work, Linda Kushley, and then we'll talk a little bit about the project that is in Counter Histories. Thank you so much, Brendan. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, so the I carry a photo with me sort of informs the project that I'm going to be talking about. So I carry a photo with me. It's a body of work that uh, grew from like encountering my sister's picture who disappeared, you know, for 10 years and how she disappeared is when I got hit by a car, was with her and then she ran away. So then when I found this photograph, I started, you know, tracing her footprint, going to places where she's been, uh, friends and stuff like that, and including my own family. So um, how I get to go to the Eastern Cape, it is through her, you know because she was buried in the Eastern Cape. So then that's when then I got introduced to my family, that side. So I carry a photo with me, you know, will be now uh, finally published by MacBook. Uh, the book will be released in May. So, yeah. So, um, so just to speak also about Ezilali in the country is mm -hmm. the project of which, um, it's about basically me getting to know my own roots, you know, back in the Eastern Cape. Just to give you like a little bit of history. So my family ended up in Johannesburg through my grandfather who, <clears throat> you know, migrated to Johannesburg in the 1960s uh, to work in the gold mines in Johannesburg. And my grandfather disappeared and never returned back home. So then people like my uncle, Malum Olisi, went to the East to, to, to Johannesburg to also, you know, seek for greener postures. You know, he also worked in the mines. He managed to bring people like my mother, you know, to Johannesburg. So, you know, I was born in Johannesburg post-94 uh, uh, democracy. And uh, the question of home, of where you are, like where, where you're from, you know, always arises. You know, so, and uh, as someone was born in Johannesburg and I've never been to the countryside, I kind of struggle to kind of answer, you know, you know, that question. So I will say I'm from Zomo, but I've never basically been there. So how I get to go to Zomo, it is through my sister Zianda, who uh, grew up in the in the Eastern Cape, uh, part of her life, because um, she went to the Eastern Cape because there was the political violence in Togos, in many black township areas in South Africa, you know, during the 1990s. So my parents sent her to stay with my grandmother in the, in the countryside. So for me, you know, just to kind of cover everything for I can afford with me, you know, I felt the need of also going to the Eastern Cape. So when I went to the Eastern Cape, I guess to connect with a bigger horizon, you know, of my family history, 
um, you know, identity and culture. So then, you know, I kind of expanded, you know, um, through also oral history, you know, both my mother and my father met in Johannesburg. And uh, so, and they are both from Eastern Cape. My father is from Gumbu, my mom is from Tomo. So, I, you know, it's like a two hour drive, you know, from both places. So I go to these places and, uh, you know, there's so much stories that are told about them. So I kind of try to go, you know, to these places and kind of make photographs. Um, so, I mean, in case of my mother, uh, which, you know, she was on that previous picture, because, I mean, for me, it's like a significant image because it's when we, you know, uh, both of us, I uh, was following her, making photographs of her, we went to the Eastern Cape. So, you know, getting to know my ancestral land, you know, and also visiting Zianda in her graveyard. So Zianda is on your right. And my uncle, Mkolisi, who brought people like my mother and many siblings of my parents, you know, to the to Johannesburg is, is, is on the left. So, I mean, for me, you know, getting to know all of this and, you know, getting to know the, you know, the landscape in the Eastern Cape, traveling back and forth, Eastern Cape and Johannesburg, which is like a nine hour drive and trying to connect both histories or both um, places of which I regard, you know, as home, you know, even in Togoza, you know, I kind of try to go to these kind of historical marked places, you know, for example, in Togoza where I grew up, there was so much violence, you know, during the 1990s, you know, and I kind of tried to go to these places. There is an image of Koglusi in the flowers, which, I mean, for me, speaks so much, you know, with this idea of resilience, because Koglusi is opposite a migrant hostel called uh, Mshaya Zafe, which, you know, there was so much violence there, and Koglusi will tell me stories about how her garden, you know, will be destroyed after this kind of uh, uh, war. You know, and in the morning, Kogulusi will kind of fix her garden, you know, and it's a garden that I grew up seeing as well, you know, you know, as a kid. So, I mean, I, I felt the need to kind of record this time, you know, I was interested in this idea of memory, I mean, this idea of history. And of course, again, I, I expand from that, I create, you know, family trees connecting both histories. Uh, from Togo, from Johannesburg, Togo, and also from the Eastern Cape in both places, um, you know, because also I was also talking about this idea of of South Africa, um, of migration, of how families were, you know, kind of the, the family structure was fragmented by, you know, the, the the kind of structural violence that was happening in the country, and how people like me, you know, at this age. Uh, post 94, I still try to go find my roots of which, you know, um, part of my roots were, were, were almost uh, disappearing in the, in the Eastern Cape because a lot of people went to Johannesburg to seek, you know, uh, work and, you know, some of them couldn't return, you know, in this case, you know, someone like my mother. So, I mean, I was interested in kind of creating that dialogue between the two places and also reflecting back you know, to history. Thank you for that. I, I looking again at these images, I'm struck by how um, seeing the synthesis of, I know the photographers that you've studied uh, their work or you knew them personally, David Goldblatt and Santa Mofa King in particular, but also um, uh, Peter Hugo and um, your deep engagement with, with the land and with the people and the connections between is, is incredibly moving. The image that we're looking at now is an installation view and um, is actually the family tree that is not a metaphor, but in fact, um, an artistic element of the project. Can you just briefly just tell us a little bit about that intervention that we're looking at now and how it relates to the work you've just described? Yes. So when I started going to the Eastern Cape, you know, going to different families of mine, which we have a big family, one thing I was doing from hearing these stories, I was making portraits of my family members there. I was also collecting photographs from like family photos, um, you know, like all this stuff, including my mom's diary is also part of this, you know, family tree, um, including, you know, the images that we had back in Togoza. So then I'm kind of creating this connection uh, through like lines. I'm creating this connection through like, um, you know, people, names, clan names, you know, um, I was interested, again, in this idea of introducing this kind of new memory, you know, 
within this uprooted, uh, fragmented family tree, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, and of course, like in this family tree, it's also about, you know, our history, which of course my family is not immune from it, you know, so basically it's me kind of reflecting basically everything, you know, it's like putting like a mind map of things in this family, you know, uh, a tree but of course this family tree is growing because i continue to explore more on on the family on the family tree mm -hmm. so again yeah. another thing sorry another thing yeah. like what i've discovered which was very interesting for this project is how the horizon always connects you know like i photographed in johannesburg which is nine hour drive to eastern cape but then there will be always like the horizon which i continue with you know and also like this idea of the horizon in English is something that you cannot arrive. Like the horizon is always distance, which in Hosa is called Mungamego, which is something you can arrive in the horizon. You can, you know, touch the horizon, you know? So, I mean, the kind of play of those words, okay, was what interested me. That's beautiful. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, I would like now to invite everyone to join us for um, a conversation with the three of you. And I have a few questions. Um, that I wanted to share, and then we'll open it up for a discussion with the wonderful audience that we have um, joining us. So are we all back on camera, Abdo and Sedrine, if you'd like to join us? And um, Linda Kushley, maybe I'll just start with you, um, since you we, the work of yours we just saw is fresh on mind. This month, um, is the 30th anniversary of Nelson Mandela's election in South Africa. And I imagine in South Africa, there are many dialogues and perhaps commemorations and thinking about what these 30 years have meant. And if I understand correctly, you're also part of the born free generation. Is that correct? You were born after, or is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I was born after. Yeah, so. Yeah, born free generation. I wondered if how you're feeling about that in this month of the anniversary, and also if there's a bit of a subtle political critique within your um, within your work and within your exploration of the homelands and going back to the Eastern Cape to think about your family's roots. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the the question of being a born free, it's a one that is very you know. Um, problematic, you know, given our history and given what black people continue to go through in South Africa. Of course, there there have been so much change, but you know, some things are still there and they're still affecting people. So I mean if you look at my work, always this kind of like a reflection of our time, more especially post-94. I mean, as a born free generation, again, when I was talking about tracing my roots, you know, which, you know, sounds on its own problematic, you know, given, you know, our history. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, the Ezilalini and I carry her forward with me, uh, basically responds to the implication of, of our past, you know, which is still there, you know, and that's why I wanna kind of try to confront that, you know, um, and, you know, we are voting in like next month, so you know and many lives of people like i've said are still you know in 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 the most difficult um in in difficult times so mm -hmm. um but yeah of course i am hopeful about my country how it's gonna go forward but yeah my work does reflect that yeah. fantastic thank you for sharing that Cedrine, I have a question for you and i will just quickly share my screen again because i realized we didn't quite get to um this image here um oops and my question for you Sadrin, is could you speak a little bit to the idea of rootedness and what it means for you to be living in one place and be making work in another place but be thinking all the time about heritage and family and you know going into a place that is not a place where you have lived or even maybe have family members in the case of Guyana, but you have a strong connection and a story you want to tell. So yeah, the idea of rootedness in your work. And maybe if you just want to tell us quickly the image on the screen now, what this is. <laughs> oh, so the image on the screen is the installation view of uh, this work 
as the restitution of the final residency work that was made during the photography festival in November. Right. Okay. Um, thank you for the question. It's actually a very interesting question. I think it's also the art of my work. Uh, I think it resonates quite a bit with what uh, Lindo Kushle was saying. Like I also, through my work, I am very much um, exploring my own identity. I think like there is like at the same time like a will to understand and know more about those places in a way to know more about myself and I would say like a part of myself that's not so easily accessible so there is like this this way of like exploring places and like encountering people in a way to know yourself better mm -hmm. I think this is also like in a way why the masculine figure is very present in my work and I explore also a lot of a lot, lot of the topic of masculinity in the Caribbean because it's also mm -hmm. very much linked to the figure of my father and trying to understand also very like just imagining his experience as a young man in the Caribbean makes me want to also like go there and photograph and understand this place better. So I would say there is a, like on the one side this idea of like exploring your own history which is very political when you come from those places and which links to like like broader history and I would say like the history maybe with the big age in general. So mm -hmm. I like this way to like always come a little bit from something that's come from within and then look for like connection outside. And I think what was interesting for me with Guyane is to actually like when I go places, I always try to find um, similarities rather than differences. So for me, it's like what like resonates between different places, like what resonates between the Caribbean and Paris, what resonates between Guyane and Martinique and trying to build like this, like a network of connection. And I really like the work of Edouard Glisson and he thinks about this like rhizomatic thinking. Mm -hmm. This for me, like this idea of the rhizome, so which is like this plants with a lot of roots that grow horizontally and that connects to each other. And I like this idea of thinking about diaspora and about like, I don't know, the experiences of like this territories that have been all like very much um, built through this through slavery of like colonization. They share like a common history together that has then evolved in different ways, but that also creates similar patterns. Mm -hmm. And this is something I'm very much interested to look for and how you create some, how like all these roots connects in places and how you connect people also through this. Absolutely. And um, Abdo, I my question for you is, could you speak a little bit about uh, the conditions of sharing your work um, or sharing art generally in Algeria? And would there be a place for the counter history that you've proposed through images and archival research to be presented in Algeria or co even collected by an, an institution? Well, um, that's uh, that's the um, one million dollar question, not because of my project, but because yeah. of the reality of things. Yeah. Um, um, institution to be interested in this, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, but uh, initiatives, yes, I guess so. That's why I think about making a book, making a zine. These things are trans transportable, and also they can survive time. They are independent of space, independent of uh, any structure who wants to control what we want to see. Um, so I think that if there is a, a venue a suitable for this work, I think it's it's books and zines, uh, especially cheap zines that I can to distribute for free for people, like it, make it available as mm -hmm. wide as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't I don't think much uh, about um, institutions in my country because uh, I know. Um, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of energy and time that I can waste there. Mm -hmm. I prefer to put it on my on my work. And I think that uh, there will be some time when we can uh, find uh, enough energy and enough um, um, will to actually uh, work with institutions in my country. I'm not talking about myself as a person, I'm talking about my generation uh, of artists and, um, and, and thinkers, photographers, um, and all spares, yes. Well, it, it's. I'm glad that you mentioned publishing because, of course, publishing is a key part of this storytelling, and not every artwork has to be collected by an institution. But proliferating scenes, catalogs, artist books is is part of the messaging, as well. Uh, we have a question from the audience from Sonia, uh, and this question is for both Abdo and Sidrine. Who is the intended audience for your photos? The people in former colonies or the former colonizing 
countries. Maybe we'll start with you, Sidreen, because we looked at the installation view of the results of your residency and actually shown in the place where the images were made. But yeah, do you want to speak a little bit to the question of audience? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Sorry. Thank you for the questions. Very interesting. Uh, I would say my case uh, is both. I would say for me, it's important to produce um, images that the people I photograph will enjoy, which is also like, I don't know, I would say this, these are places where, um, I don't know, life's not easy. And you like, you can like, it's easy to photograph those places with a little bit like a lot of melancholy. And I always try to find beauty in, in stuff and people also to like in a way to empower and in a way to like I don't know I feel beauty is very important in any struggle like we always think about like how we have to fight for things but I think beauty is a big important part of it so I think like in this way I really want to I don't know I like to make pictures that people like photograph will enjoy and will consume and will then see themselves in them um in a way that is empowering but I also think for me, there's always this idea of like, okay, there's been this representation here, like, I don't know, in Europe or wherever, that's been very present of the Caribbean. And this is something I interested in to challenge. So it's not only for the people I photograph, I would say it's also like more broadly um, addressed to point. Those and, addressing those representations that are already pre-existing um, in a bit like in a challenging way, but also within the, in the softly, sensitively, tenderly challenging way. Exactly. And how about you, Abdo? There was an additional question for you from Lena, um, just about striking a balance between archival images and your own black and white images. Um, so yeah, could you talk a little bit about that and also the question of audience? Yeah, um, I, I'm, it's uh, it's the audience, my, it's my people for this project, for sure. Uh, I, I, I want to reach to that point for that project for us from this with this project for us to see each other you know um regardless of any other stories like to see to see each others uh in birthdays uh weddings uh dancing uh just chain out nothing important but that nothing important is also important because this is what mm -hmm. makes a history we don't have to be the hero with the gun to make a history. We can just have a birthday. We're still making a history, and this mm -hmm. is. And, and I think this is an important part that is overlooked and mis disregarded uh, from our own imagination of who is Algerian. Um, as for uh, balancing, um, I'm not sure about balancing. I still don't know. It's. I have a lot of elements, a lot of directions. Uh, I'm even as a as an artist, I'm lost in the middle. I love being lost. Confusion is my thing, but mm -hmm. um, I, I try to regard all of these material as visual elements, and I try to com combine things together for them to serve the purpose of telling the story. Uh, whether it is my own photographs or scans from families, uh, uh, albums, or from newspapers. Uh, my goal is to uh, tell a story, to build a narrative. So whatever means is necessary however you know how i i combine those things i try to combine this thing the best way to tell that story uh the only thing i can control because all of the other elements are scanned uh, our family album or or photos from newspaper the only mm -hmm. thing i can control is the way i photograph i try to uh photograph my own style and way but also i try to be uh to try to tune a little bit with the within the family album uh, kind of uh, photography, like a candid photography. I try to do that. It's still uh, on the way, but this is something I'm considering to think how to tune some tune my photography with that, you know, with that the original idea, people, the other people who are making pictures in my country. Well, that's a great observation and leads to the next question, which is actually for all three of you from Alan. And Alan um, mentions that there is a clear relationship between the themes of all three of your bodies of work, but you are working with very, very different visual strategies and styles. So just like what you said, Ab Abdo, could you all talk a little bit about your photographic style and also how, how and when did you really feel like you found your particular voice, your way of, of shooting, like what makes it dis distinctive? And maybe we'll start with you, Linda Kushle, because I was as I said, um, really moved by seeing this new body of work because it showed 
um, so many visual histories of recent South African um, photography that clearly are in your mind and and heart and when you're shooting and um, yeah how do you how did you know when you you got your style and you were really like onto something yeah I think for me you know um, with this one I mean I wanted to try like something new I've always worked on black and white sometimes I mix but for this one I also wanted to like play with metaphors you know like oral history again, which I've never, you know, done that. I was like a straight kind of documentarian, uh, you know, now I wanted to kind of see how I can include other, you know, um, elements, you know, into the work, like creating a family tree and other images that are not mine and stuff like that. So, I mean, I, I could say it's, if I couldn't, if I can give it a name, it's kind of like storytelling, uh, a lyrical documentary, you know, if that's you know, if that's a correct term. So yeah, I mean, I wanted to kind of expand my horizon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you, Cedrine? Did you have a feeling, either with a previous project or when you were a student, that you were onto something and you were you were really latching onto a distinctive style or your voice as a photographer? Yeah, I think it built uh, a little bit over time, but I think like finding. Um... I think for me also finding a way to be out in the world with the camera say as a female photographer and like in the place where I photograph I like the I don't know I found my voice really with this like I like this heavy material I like to be really present in the space I like to create also like it creates a bit like of, of a um I don't know the way I can engage with my portrait it's almost a lot of people I photograph is different and I think there is kind of like a lot of tenderness in my pictures. I think this is something I like to reclaim. Absolutely. Also. And yeah, just I love um, shooting with colors and I love printing like in the dark room. And I, I like this process of spending a lot of time with the picture. I also think I chose to a camera and a lens that somehow gives me a distance that is a little bit closer to like usual documentary photography, which I think I come from, but somehow also take took a step, a little bit step mm -hmm. like aside, aside from it with this, like a little bit like closer and always like more enclosed look on things. And I think very much a night to detail. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for this really rich and generative um, conversation. It's such a pleasure to hear from all of you and having spent a lot of time uh, working with the magazine and editing your work and editing the essays that went along um, with your portfolios. It's so wonderful to hear the details and the stories behind it. And um, I, before we joined this call, I asked our panelists if they had ever met each other in person before and they hadn't. So I would just close by my sincere wish that you, a, you all may one day meet each other collaborate, share ideas, and um, to, if I don't, if it doesn't sound sentimental to say, to use the beautiful term that Linda Kushley shared with us, which is to uh, touch the horizon. So um, thank you all so much. I look forward to following your work and on behalf of Aperture, thank you so much for sharing your, um, your projects with Aperture and with Magnum Foundation. So until next time. <laughs>